This is Anna Lillius from the University of Central Florida, and today I'm going to be interviewing Bill Bellevue, who is an award-winning nature writer, conservationist, documentary filmmaker, and educator from Sanford, Florida, who's, who has written the Central Florida Reads Book of the Year, River of Lakes. Can you please tell us what was it about your childhood that made you love nature, and what can we do as parents to help um, give this love of nature to our children? Well, I, I really had no choice in my childhood. I sort of grew up in the country, so we weren't surrounded with a lot of uh, man-made contrivances. All we had was the woods and the, the landscape and the water, and um, so you got to know it very well. I grew up on the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland, and at the time, it was uh, even more countryfied than, than it is now. It was isolated. Uh, the culture itself was pretty intact. People worked on the water on the Chesapeake Bay, or they, they were farmers. So for a young boy, sort of learning his way around, what you simply did was you, you, you hiked in the woods. We didn't call it hiking. Then. We played. We, we walked for miles and miles. We looked for little streams. We fished in the streams. Nature was all around us, it's all we had. So that's what we knew. We didn't sit in front of the Nintendo because there was no Nintendo. TV reception wasn't very good. So we were, by default, we were kind of forced outdoors, which was a wonderful thing because then we, we became more intimate with the seasons, more intimate with the places, the, the true place in which we live. Today, uh, um, as, as, as people who are parenting children, I mean, the, the, certainly you don't have to go to a place where you have no electronics, electronic infrastructure, but you can certainly pull the plug once in a while and encourage your kid to get outside and to do things with them that translates into fun. I mean, with my family, we would go fishing, we would go sport fishing, we would go crabbing for blue crabs, uh, we would go to the uh, to the shore, to the beach. Uh, so we did, most of the things we did for fun were, were outdoors and there's still an awful lot of opportunity for discovery. And I think kids love discovery. Unfortunately, they find it a lot of times through electronics, which is discovery sort of thrice removed. And if you can kind of cut that, you know, off at, at, the, at the origins, go back to what it is that the kid really you know, really is turned on by it. I still feel most kids have the capacity to be turned on by it, discovery. Um, what inspired you to go up the St. Johns River and write about it? I'd, I'd been recreating on the river myself in different parts of the river, not even understanding what the river was about. Um, I was a fisherman, a sport fisherman, and I learned to fly fish. And so I would go out and, and fly fish on different parts of the river for the fun of it. Um, I liked to paddle. At that time, when I was first learning the river, I would paddle a canoe out on parts of the river, mainly the Wakaiba, because it was simply closest to my home. And the Wakaiba is a major tributary of the St. John's. And I would, I would uh, dive in some of the uh, deeper springs, like Blue Springs and some of the places along the river. So I was having these different experiences with the river and coming to know it, but only in parts. And, and finally, one day, I, I had an opportunity to, to, um, to work for the Discovery Channel. They were doing a lot of field expeditions mm -hmm. for their websites. This is back in the mid-90s. And they asked me if I would do one on the St. John's River and come up with a story for it. And what, what kind of story could you do if you went down this, this river that we believe is historic, but we don't know too much about it? And I said, well, I'd like to try to retrace William Bartram and his, you know, and, and his travels on the, on the river. He spent a lot of time on St. John's. So I made the point then to do that for two weeks. Went out on the river, spent two weeks retracing the, the travels that Bartram made in the 1760s and 1770s up, up the St. John's. But in, in doing that, I also needed background information beyond what Bartram had written in Travels. Mm -hmm published in 1791, I needed as much background information as I, as I could get on the river. And while I found a lot of bits and pieces written here and there in books and magazine articles and scientific abstracts, 
there was no modern book devoted wholly to the natural and cultural history of the St. John's River. And I was astounded. And mm -hmm. so I, I was thinking, wow. <laughs> You know, and, and that, that, you know, that processed, I processed that in my mind for, for a year or so, and then I thought, gee, I really ought to write a book. How did um, authors who also made that trip, Marjorie Kinnon Rawling, Sidney Lanier, besides Bartram, inspire you, or did you read their books beforehand? Um, As I was learning about the St. John's, the St. John's is a very complex river. It's different things at different places. It's 310 miles long. The upper river is, is, is more marshy, much different from the middle river, which is more of a swamp. Lower river, more of an estuary. And as I began to read what others had written, I, I began to understand that they knew certain parts of the river very well, but did not know the whole river mm -hmm. as an ecological system. And uh, then I began to read uh, Marjorie Kennan Rollins and, and, and her, her, her chronicle of the time that she spent not just in Cross Creek, which is in the watershed of the St. John's, mm -hmm. but the time she and her neighbor, Desi Smith, actually came down to Puzzle Lake and took a boat back to Cross Creek. I read about Sidney Lanier being on the St. John's on the steamboats and being commissioned by a steamboat company to write a guidebook on, on the St. John's and the Ocklawaha River. And I began to see his, his own affection for and understanding of this wonderful, magical sort of resource and, and the same with Bartram. You know, I read mm -hmm. Bartram's work and uh, travels and, 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 and I saw the awe, the sense of awe that Bartram had when, when he first began to see some of the springs. Mm -hmm. He called the, the, the St. John's a grand and noble San Juan. Mm -hmm. I mean he was really taken to the place. Did uh, making this trip yourself um, give you new respect for what Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings did? Uh, many years ago in the 1930s when she took this trip. It did. Uh, for, for what Rollins did, for, for Bartram and all those guys, I mean, it was much harder then. It was easier for me, certainly, because there are maps now. And the maps back then were far less complete. And certainly when, when Bartram was on the river, the maps were very incomplete. Nobody was even sure where the river went. Well, they had to be intrepid. They had to be stubborn. They had to be... Uh, they had to have a certain courage to go out on the river then. Nobody quite knew what that river was about, and, and there were some real desperado sort of folks living around the river. I mean, Florida has always been home to desperados, and, and when you have this wonderful jungle-like uh, watershed surrounding the river, it's easy to hide out. Um, Marjorie Kinnon Rowling talks about that enchant that special place of enchantment what is your favorite or your special place of enchantment along that whole 300 mile river? You know, Anna, it's like the place that I can get to with some amount of efficiency, you know, the place that I, that's not too far from where I live, actually. And luckily, we live in an area here in central Florida where we have the Wakaba River, a major tributary of the St. John's but also the best protected river in Florida and certainly the best protected part of the St. John's watershed. Not too far from where I live, uh, there's a little creek called the Blackwater Creek, which is a tributary of Wakaiba. And you can uh, find little springs along the Blackwater Creek that create their own little runs and the runs will conflux with the creek itself and then go down to the, to the river. I love those little springs, they're magical. Uh, Robin says, I don't know how we can live without some small place of enchantment to turn to. Mm -hmm. And those are enchantment. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're tangible signs of enchantment. They're coming out of the bottom of heavily forested bluffs. Uh, they're surrounded by subtropical foliage, by swamp tupelo and cypress and sweet gum and mosses. And, and, and birds are, are in the trees. and, and, and it, the whole experience is one of, of, of total enchantment for me. And I've seen some of your films of the, uh, of the diving expeditions that you've taken. Can you talk more about that? Uh, on the river itself? Yes. Uh, yeah. um, we, we, we were able to, uh, in several of the films, uh, one was on the Wakaba River, one was uh, a film called In Search of Xanado, where we actually made a point to, to tie in Coldridge and, and, and Bartram to, to the uh, story. We 
we did go into the springs, we went into the cave systems uh, and explored them and, and shot some shot some video uh, from them, brought back some video. Um, it's it's, it's, these are places that very few people on earth see. Mm -hmm. To me, it's again, it's a wonderful privilege because Florida is thought to be tame and domesticated. And here we were in Silver Glen Springs, for instance, which is in the Ocala National Forest on the west shore of Lake George. And we were diving inside this cave, which, which is a spectacular cave. A couple hundred feet away on the top side, there are people partying down with no concept that there's this magical underworld that, mm -hmm. that sort of pins the, the reality of, of the place that they're in. So to, to, to go in those places, um, again, I, I can't get away from the sense of wonder. Do you think that your book has had any effect with, you know, sort of um, making people more aware of the river? You know, Anna, I like to think that everything we do has an effect. You know, we can't always measure it. It's a subjective thing. As writers and as artists, you, you kind of hope what you do has, has, a, has an impact. I, I do know the, the, book, the book uh, is selling well. It's in its eighth printing now. It's being used in a lot of colleges and universities. There's been a couple feature, uh, documentary films that have been produced since the, film, since the uh, book uh, came out. So I know there's a rising sort of collective awareness of the river. I can't say it's because of the book, but I'm just, I can say that I'm very happy that it, that it is happening. That there are, there is an increasing uh, need in Florida for knowledge about natural places. You know, I think there's, people are beginning to realize we're losing our natural places at an alarming rate. So let's figure out what, what's here before it goes away. And that's, that really applies to the St. John's. Um, do you by any chance have a website? I do. A uh, website, uh, of two websites. One is subsidized by the Authors Guild for Author Guild members. It's my name, BillBellville.com. We have another website for a nonprofit environmental education, uh, at 501c3, that, that we co founded, myself and Bob Shagir, mm -hmm. who's a, a, P, a veteran PBS producer. He and I co founded that several years ago. And the name of the company is called Equinox Documentaries, and the name of the website is Equinox Documentaries, one word, dot org. And uh, you can find out more about my, my books uh, on, on my website and some of my projects, uh, public appearances and so forth. And on the Equinox website, there's more information about the films that we've done. Uh, and, and the one film that most directly relate to the St. John's that we're working on right now in terms of fundraising and some early research is, is a film called uh, In Marjorie's Wake. You asked me earlier about mm -hmm. Marjorie Ken and Rollins. And uh, In Marjorie's Wake uh, very much uh, relates to, to uh, Rollins, to the way that her life was, was shaped and influenced by where she lived. Perhaps more than any other single person, Rollins was, was really influenced by where she lived. And if you talk about a sense of place, mm -hmm. she sh surely realized that in, in her writing and helped us as readers to realize that as well. So, so we want to use Rollins, and we want to use in specific, specifically the trip that she took from Puzzle Lake uh, back, back to Cross Creek on, on a small boat with her neighbor, Desi Smith. We want to replicate that trip with two people, Leslie Poole, who's, who's a, a, a professor of uh, environmental studies at Rollins College, and Jennifer Chase, who, who's an educator and a musician, a, a, a jazz, blues jazz musician from Jacksonville. And they will be the two women who will, who will make the trip itself. And they'll have real discovery along the way, because despite the, the newness of, of all of our, our wonderful contrivances, there's still lots of wild land along that river. So they can have adventures, and we want to allow them to do that. But we also want to be able to use their trip as a metaphor for how the river has shaped culture and art over time. So on one level, it will be an adventure. It will be a travelogue, if you will, that will help reintroduce people to the, to the, the beauty of the St. John's. Uh, it will be an ecological sort of uh, awakening, but it also will be a, uh, uh, it will be a method to show that, that there are indeed ways in which environment shapes us. 
we can't separate humanities from natural history. You know, humanities ha have, been, have been influenced by natural history over time. And so here are some examples, and, and let us show you those examples. Show, don't tell. Have you filmed this trip yet? Or? No, we haven't. We're still in the throes of the final throes of fundraising. We've uh -huh. had some very generous uh, uh, folks who, who, who have funded us. We're 501c3, mm -hmm. so it is a, a charitable foundation. And uh, we're hoping to, to be able, with complete funding, uh, to be able to go out and, and to begin uh, the actual trip itself. We were able to film Desi Smith. Uh, she oh, passed. Great. Yeah, she yeah. passed away uh, last year. But before she passed away, uh -huh. 96 years old, we went over uh, to her uh, house. Uh -huh. She lived on Crystal River. Yes. We went down by the edge of the water, and we talked to her for several hours uh -huh. about that trip. And she reminisced uh -huh. about Cross Creek. She reminisced about the trip that she and Marge took on mm -hmm. the St. Johns River, and uh, she was uh, very, very lucid and very engaged. And uh, so, we, so we have that on film, and, and we. We will weave that into our own mm -hmm. uh, documentary. What about writing? What are you working on uh, now? Um, I've done a couple magazine pieces. I've done some work for Forum, the Florida Humanities Council magazine, and some, some travel adventure magazines. And I uh, have a, another book that's coming out this winter. Uh, it's more of a personalized uh, book, I suppose, than, than my other three books have been. It's uh, about my experiences living in a wonderful cracker farmhouse for the last 15 years and seeing the neighborhood uh, around the, the home change, see the community change as sprawl encroached. Mm -hmm. And sprawl is simply a just poorly planned development, which pretty much gobbles up the, the natural land and, and affects community, it affects social structure, it affects the environment. And at, at the very you know, bottom line, it affects the people there, like myself. So I've tried to put a human face on sprawl, if you will. The book is entitled, Losing It All to Sprawl, How Progress Ate My Cracker Landscape. <laughs> what final message would you like to leave with the people who are watching this program? Get outside and, and enjoy, the, enjoy the natural places. You'll only know by having having contact yourself with it. There's only so much reading we can do. Nature does predate thought. Nature allows us solace, it allows us a balance. It's, there are many lessons to be revealed in nature, and before it's too late, let's get out there and understand them. And, and then hopefully we'll be moved to want to protect them. I don't think protection of, of our remaining natural places in Florida will come out of uh, intellectual rhetoric you know, that, that's nice to have the facts and, 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 and to understand how we're losing ground, groundwater and to understand how we're losing wetlands and what effects that have on us in terms of, of, of ecology. But the true effect is a personal one. And we're, if we don't have a personal connection, we're not going to be moved to have an ethic to want to protect anything else. So go out and have fun. Go out and go fishing and paddle. <laughs>